Welcome everybody to module four of the ELD standards framework coffee chats. I'm Ivana Manthor Anderson, one of the ESL title three consultants at NCDPI. And today we are excited once again to have Lanny Simpson and her cup of coffee to share with us about identifying language expectations within a unit. So I laugh when I'm about to say that we should all be somewhat familiar with how WebEx works now. Next slide. <laughs> even though I seem to struggle with it every time. Uh, you have the opportunity to look at things in different ways. So you see how the layout, you can, um, in the up, upper right-hand corner, you can change the way your video is laid out, whether you want to see participants or the panel uh, with just the speaker or the screen. You can also mute and unmute yourself, turn your camera off and on. When you are not using it, it disappears. So you can see those control panels are typically at the bottom of your screen. So, with that said, I am going to turn it over to Lanny and let's get into module four. Thank you all for being here today. Thanks, Ivana. Welcome, everybody. Um, we've had a bit of a break, three weeks uh, to be exact, since we last met for module three. And today we are going to be talking about module four and Focusing our attention on identifying language expectations within a unit. So, um, we continue to get more practical uh, with our uh, healthy chats and applying the new um, ELD standards to units of instruction. And we've done our WebEx duties. And so in module four, teachers start out by considering, and I'm going to read you a quote straight from WIDA, which key language use is most prominent in both interpretive and expressive modes of language of the learning process for students. So last time we practiced looking at a unit, and we identified the overarching key language use. And we talked about how it's important to look um, toward your learning activities. You may have more than one key language use nested within a unit, particularly depending on the size of the unit. And, um, but the overarching key language use would be largely driven by whatever your summative assessment um, or culminating um, piece of work might be that your students would produce. And so what we wanna do now is to stretch our learning and consider interpreting, interpretive and expressive modes of language and how we're gonna leverage those for student learning. So I, I want us just to take a moment um, and WIDA has moved from the terms of receptive language to interpretive language. So I want you to type into the chat box, what makes interpretive modes of language different from receptive modes of language? So um, open-ended question, um, no answer is wrong, just your thoughts on that. What would be the differences? Okay. So Sandy says students are communicating what they know. Okay, we're talking about interpretive. It also includes viewing instead of just listening. Viewing is included. Interpretive is more active than receptive. That is an interesting comment. Deidre, would you like to unmute yourself to sh further uh, elaborate on your comment? Um, it just seems that receptive is just kind of the visual of sitting and receiving language just being poured over you. But interpretive is you actually having to process and even if it's not a verbal response, you're still making meaning of it in your mind. 
Okay. Thank you for that, Deidre. Yeah, and Charlene adds interpretive language consists of listening, reading, and viewing in which students make meaning from what they read, see, or hear. Leah says it's a more complex process and everybody is absolutely right about that. Now, let's shift over and let's think about expressive modes of communication versus productive. So what would the difference be between expressive and productive language as WIDA has widened the lens, if you will, of understanding language in terms of production and expression? What differentiates the expressive mode from the classic productive modes that we're typically used to with WIDA? You use the graphics for clues. In expressive students share their understandings through writing, speaking or represented in some other graphic or visual way. Exactly, it's expanding the lens. Speaking, writing and representing, Lisa spot on. Yep, it also includes representing. Mallory, an example could be visual or drawing instead of just writing or speaking. Exactly. And so WIDA has really widened the lens, uh, if you will, of the modes of language. And honestly, they're, they're shifting away toward um, thinking more about multimodal means of communication rather than just using linguistic support, sensory supports, interactive supports, the old three categories that we've had since the beginning of time um, from WIDA of supports. Leah adds different connotations in expressive. Leah, would you like to unmute yourself and expand on that comment? That is a fascinating comment. I'd love to hear your elaboration. Hi, I was just thinking about with expressive, the meaning can come out very different um, versus like a productive, it's like, you know, cut and dry. So depending on the mode of expressive language and the context, the connotations change. Very nice. Which Very makes nice. it complex. Absolutely. 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 Love using those linguistic terms. Great. Excellent job, folks. Okay. And so you can see that we just taken the four domains of language and shifted the categories from productive and receptive language to expressive and interpretive. So why do you think it was important for WIDA to add these dimensions of expressive and interpretive to the four domains of language? And this is, this is wide open. Open-ended question, no wrong or right answer. Why do you think WIDA has moved in this direction in adding in different modes of communication. Increase digital learning tools and di digital learning and, ah, interesting point. Okay, so because, yes, of remote learning, absolutely more targeted goals and expectation because multilingual learners can communicate in a variety of ways. Absolutely. Love it. Yes. And so what we have is that shift toward multimodal communication, recognizing that English language learners will communicate in a variety of ways rather than just the simple four domains of language. So 
I, I love the, um, the adding of the layer of complexity that um, our learners can, um, our multilingual learners can communicate to us with. So perfect. Okay. So we talked about um, last time we worked on our Padlet and um, you all identified a unit with a couple of um, learning activities embedded in that unit and what you thought your overarching key language use would be. And so um, we, we've done that. And so now we're gonna dig a little deeper and we're gonna look at language expectations for an upcoming unit. So within that language expectation, we're going to look at the most prominent ones in our unit and then the most prominent language functions and then the supports that are needed. So for example, when I reflect on a unit that I've taught in the past to um, fourth grade and it was um, the development of electricity through the lives of two inventors. And so um, what we did is we read um, this little novel here. It's a very short one. What's the big idea, Ben Franklin? You may have um, read this with your students. And uh, it talks about Ben Franklin's contributions to um, the harnessing of electricity, if you will. Then we read excerpts from a second biography, who was Thomas Alva Edison. And we actually focused on chapters that um, contained his contributions to the development of electricity. And so after reading, and we read um, using various strategies, anticipation guides, we use partner reading and summarizing our pre-taught key vocabulary. And, and so the biographies focused on the work with electricity and after reading and doing the comprehension uh, activities, we then built, we then watched a video from Discovery Ed on circuit diagrams and we learned how circuit diagrams work and then as a culminating activity, we actually built lighthouses. Think about fourth grade North Carolina social studies standards as well. And we built lighthouses out of two liter soda bottles, um, flashlight bulbs and little hearing aid batteries. And so um, this dovetailed into a social studies um, North Carolina unit on North Carolina lighthouses. And so it was a pretty big unit because we were dealing with language arts and reading this informational text in um, these biographies, um, viewing a video of circuit diagrams. And so if I reflect on that unit and work backwards, I wanna think about, well, what would be my most prominent key uses for that unit? And so when I reflect on the learning activities, um, I want to identify the most prominent key language uses. This was for my fourth grade ELs. And so I'm going to go in my um, WIDA ELD um, new standards notebook, um, which I have downloaded. And I want to think about, well, okay, one of the uh, learning activities for my um, unit was to develop an infographic on either Ben Franklin or Thomas Jefferson. Students were um, able to choose. And, and so I'm thinking, okay, well, in language arts, I, and, and in constructing this infographic, I am thinking about key language uses. And so let's, oops, I have to come out of present mode to drag and drop, don't I? All right, let's see if I can come out of present mode here. And so when I look at the language of language arts, I see narrate, inform, and argue as being um, 
the three most prominent. And then when I think about my learning activity of writing an infographic, um, we'll, we'll come back to what you think the key language use would be. Uh, and then I'm just gonna drag this on down for the language of science, because if you recall, we watched a video um, on uh, circuit diagrams and then the learning activity um, that was connected to that piece of the unit was students would explain to a partner um, the how how a circuit diagram worked so let's go back into present mode here and keeping those thoughts in mind I want you to enter into the chat box for the infographic that we were constructing after we read the two biographies. What would the key language use be? What would you think the key language use should be for that? Where we had to construct an infographic on either Ben Franklin's contributions to the development of electricity, or you chose um, Thomas Edison and constructed an infographic on his contributions to um, electricity. Mallory, Jesse says inform, Mallory says inform. Yeah, lots of folks, Charlene inform, Crystal, yep, Svetlana, you got it. Everybody is spot on. So really when you stop and reflect about units you've already taught, yeah, uh, you're really working inductively, like you're, you're going backwards and thinking, okay, how does this fit into the key language uses? And so let's now shift to my learning activity about um, describing to a partner how circuits work. And so we're obviously in the language of science here and so you can look at this um, row right here in our matrix of prominent key language uses. What would be, um, what would you think would be the uh, key language use that we would be focusing on when we are explaining to a partner how circuits work? If you'll enter in the chat box. Yeah, Vanessa, you got it. Explain. Crystal, Sandy, yep, yep. Svetlana, Adriana, explain. And that one was a little bit easier, wasn't it? Because I told you we were going to be explaining to a partner. Uh, but that is the way that we want to think backwards about units that we've already done. So you guys are, are absolutely spot on there. Okay. So. Now I wanna dig a little deeper in thinking about my um, unit on the two uh, inventors um, contributions to the development of electricity. And let's think about our infographic. And um, we've already talked about that that would be the key language use of explain. And we're in language arts, so I know that I'm sorry, it's the key language use of inform. Um, I know that we are in over here it, with the ELD language arts four or five inform expressive. We're looking to construct informational text, aren't we? We're constructing an infographic. And so when you then look at language functions, there's a variety of language functions. And honestly, that depends on where your students are in the process uh, of learning and what you as a teacher want them to do. Like, so what I, I know I want my students to be able to inform. Um, using the infographic with each man's contributions to the development of electricity. And so I'm going to select adding precision and details to define or describe, uh, compare or classify my topic or entity. So this is what I would like for my students to work on in constructing an infographic. Any number of these 
um, language functions are just fine. It's that's where I want to begin with my students. So let me ask you this question. I want you to reflect on um, my my unit, my model unit here with um, on electricity. And so our students are writing an infographic. How would you get them to add precision and details to their infographic on each invent or whatever inventor they chose contributions to electricity? What might you do as a teacher to help your students to add precision and details to their infographic that they're constructing, if you will? I'll reflect on that for a moment and then type it into the chat box. How would you support your kiddos to add precision and details to that informational text they're constructing? Wait just a minute for responses. No wrong or right answer here. Isabella bullet points. Yeah, bullet points are a great place to start. Expand when writing accordion paragraphs to provide more details. Ooh, I like that. Sandy provide a word bank, sentence frames. I would give them a graphic organizer to show main idea and details like boxes and bullets. Chachana, I, uh, Chachana, I would too. I love that. Deidre, a completed model and graphic organizer. Absolutely. And Lisa, would you like to unmute? Was it Lisa who? Oh, where is it? Yes, Lisa, will you unmute and explain to us accordion paragraphs to provide more details? I don't know that strategy. With the accordion paragraphs, my fifth graders are using those today, actually. Start out with a simple one sentence introduction and supporting sentences and then you mm -hmm. can but we go back and we expand that like an accordion so they could write their um introduction as one sentence but they might write their supporting details instead of three sentences that might become six so they would elaborate on those three main points and you could expand it even longer than eight sentences if you want to so it's just a way for them to structure and organize their writing but to develop and grow those ideas as well Nice. It reminds me of Margarita Calderon's cut and grow strategy. Um, nice. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Okay. So for our second learning activity uh, in the unit, uh, I shared with you about how our students viewed the um, circuit diagram video, um, and then they actually uh, reviewed it uh, using Ed Puzzle with a partner answering questions and finally explained to a partner how circuit diagrams actually work. And so we know that our key language use is explain and our kiddos are constructing scientific explanations. So as a teacher, I'm going to review these language functions and select wherever I think my students need to work. And for, um, for our um, oral partner sharing activity, I've selected that they're going to describe observations or data 
um, about a phenomenon. And so um, what I'd like for you to think about is how do we hold students accountable when our um, learning activity is um, an oral um, partner exchange? Um, how do we hold students accountable for um, those oral activities? What do you do? I have my students record. Excellent, Shane. Require the use of key vocabulary or record. Great, Deidrea. Mike, checklist of expectations. Must haves are amazing. Mike, can you unmute and share? I see talk moves, nice Mallory, along with sentence starters and frames. You sentence frames have the partner share what the other one said. Rubric based, yep. A checklist or rubric for peer review, absolutely spot on. Mike, can you unmute? Maybe not. Must I have seen a mic on the attendee list. You don't? Mm -mm. So I was trying to figure out who it might be. Well, he may be listening in with somebody else because he's chatting. Uh, he says he's trying. Okay. Okay. There he is. I found him. Um, let me see if I can help. How about now? Can you speak now, Mike? I've unmuted him here. Okay. Deidre, you want to share about must-haves and amazings? Um, that wasn't mine, but I can. Um, okay. It's just thinking through what you're going to absolutely require your students to produce in your must-haves, and then your amazings, or if they want to go above and beyond um, what it what that looks like. It, it's in my mind, it's similar to a rubric. Yep. Perfect. Absolutely. Okay. Sue says, ask students to share what his or her partner shared. Absolutely. Um, so critical mass, um, as everybody obviously already knows and practices to have that accountability uh, so that you can assess what um, students are producing. Okay. All right. Very nice. So this is our Padlet that we uh, used last time where you um, either made a recording describing your unit briefly and uh, at least one learning activity and what the overarching key language use was. And so we're going to dig deeper today. And um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to go to the next slide and then we'll we'll come back. You're going to reflect on your own unit and I'm going to Ivana has already put it into the chat. Way to go Ivana thinking ahead here. Um, you can go to the Padlet to review what you entered on um, your unit and the overarch the learning activity and the overarching key language use. We're going to uh, take it a little further today, and we are going to identify the most prominent language expectation that would go along with your learning activity and the accompanying language function and the supports that are needed, which will come out of your own head. And so, what we can, there are a couple of things we can do. First of all, when you reflect on your own unit, don't click on this yet, just let me show you. It's going to um, prompt you to make a copy of a document. Now, 
that document will look like this, except this rightmost column is not filled out. I, I actually um, completed a model um, for uh, you to look at. And so, I mean, basically it's very simple. I put my topic in for my unit, my materials, and then I um, just in bullet summary, um, added information on the learning activities in my unit, um, some of the front loading that I would do, and uh, some of the um, expectations I have for the products that students would produce. So you will work on filling this out today, not yet. Um, identify the key language uses, which we already did, but it's been three weeks, so you're going to enter those in, and then you're going to actually dig into the new WIDA standards um, notebook, which I have linked here on this document. It'll be linked on your blind one, or if you have your notebook handy or your spiral bound, if you were fortunate enough for your district to buy the new WIDA standards, you got it. And so you're going to dig around and find the most prominent language expectation that goes along with your learning activity and what language function you want to select to go with it. Uh, you can also add in linguistic supports that you would include in your unit. We're not going to do anything with language features today. That's for the next time we meet. Okay, so. Let me go back. There's our Padlet. So once you have completed the, the template, you're just going to go in, copy the URL address, and then you're going to go back to the Padlet. And if you'll notice, I you'll see it. You have to edit in order to add it back to the Padlet. So I'm going to click on those three buttons, edit post, and you'll see that I came in down here and I just simply pasted the URL that will take me to that template of my unit. So that's what I would like for you to do. And we are going to take, um, well, uh, probably about, we're going to work for five minutes and I'll check back in with you guys, see if you need more time. And Ivana, I also need for you to put into the chat box the, um, the link for reflect on your unit so that folks can, I'm sorry. I said, I just did. That was slide 10, right? All right. Perfect. Yep. Perfect. So you're going to work in that template and then you can go back and forth between the Padlet. If you need to look at the Padlet first to remember to what unit you talked about last time, look at it first, then go to the template or you can start with the template if you've got it in your head and then you'll just when you're done, you'll copy the URL address for your template that you filled out and then pop it into the Padlet on your post. If you didn't post last week, just start a new post um, and paste your um, link to your template. Are there any questions? Let us know if you have any trouble with the links.
Yes, Lisa, I will, I will put that in. Let's make sure I get that. Okay. And it, you're at, I'm going to put it in that this is model template. Okay. Sorry for my bad typing. And we have plenty of time. Access is denied. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Hang on. My bad. That's need to do anybody. Anyone with the link? Copy link. Now let's try that again. Model template. Try that, Lisa. Yeah, I see lots of folks on it now. I apologize. And I got pretty detailed on my bulleted summary of my unit and learning activities. You don't, you certainly do not need to be that detailed, but I just wanted to give you a picture of what the unit was really like.
Do we need more time? Okay. Got it. Crystal's having trouble with the link, but I'm not sure which one. Maybe that's been fixed already, and I see a, a number of comments that I don't know if you've had a chance to see yet. I, I found it. Oh, good, Chris. Thank you. Okay.
we do need to be wrapping up our work. Uh, even if you're you're not finished, which it's it's okay if you're not finished, you you can continue to to work on this. And we will work on it also um, next week. So if you would go ahead and just copy your URL of what you've gotten done and then just paste it into the Padlet. So I'm gonna head on over to the Padlet. Did the Google drawing. Good job. Deidre, you want to paste this link into your um, Padlet posting. You want to edit your Padlet posting and add the link. You were, you were here when you done that. Matter. So right here, I can do it for you. Maybe. Okay, let me copy that for you. Can I get to it? Yeah, and copy. Let's see if we can get it in there. Okay, and I uh, updated, and there is your template. Awesome. I wish we had another whole hour to go. go I know it. <laughs> I know. So we're we're gonna go ahead and um, have a couple people share, okay? And so um, Sandy has entered her link to her document. Let's see if we can go there. I don't think it's. I think I'm gonna have to open another room to get there. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you're going to need to be sure that your template is shared with anyone who has the link. Okay, so Sandy, if you want to share with um, us your uh, just a little bit about your just a little bit about your unit and the learning activities and the language expectations. So mine was focusing strictly on arguing um, as my overarching my key language news. And so I really wanted to target that. So when I go into the, my language expectations using the graphic um, that I've given to my students, I really want them to be able to interpret what is um, the diagram and then be, I didn't um, be able to um, determine um, an argument based on that diagram. And I don't have my summary of my unit or anything in there. I was looking through the language functions. For the language functions, I wanted to um, have them make their own claim about when they're reading the diagram, what is going to happen based on that claim. Um, like, for example, the snake, um, 
uh, as being a predator to the rabbit and what would what would that cause the rabbit um, population to grow or uh, to increase or decrease and what would the food, other competition be and what would happen if another scenario was put um, in the diagram so I kind of wanted to focus on these and work backwards so I was looking at my um, language functions and then I was going to go back and work backwards with my um, learning activities Thank you, Sandy. Okay. And is there anyone else who has had time to enter their link? I'm hunting. Ah, oh, here's somebody. El fourth grade ELA poetry. And if you can. Sue so says she can't open the Padlet either. Sure. I did a, a poetry Damn. that's more like a mini unit. Oh, can you hear me? I'm now, now try. Yep, we've got the volume up. Go ahead. Oh, all right, thank you. Um, I did uh, uh, the entry on Padlet about poetry. It's more like a mini unit. Um, so uh, for the activities, uh, students will read uh, different poems and uh, different texts uh, on the same topic. And then um, I will pre-teach them the vocabulary that will highlight the characteristics of the two genres, words such lines, stanzas, rhyme, repetition, sentences, paragraphs, and uh, words like that. Uh, then we will use that vocabulary to analyze poems and prose side by side. And as we do that, we will um, create a T chart together as a class uh, and we will write down the characteristics of the two different genres in that uh, chart. Uh, uh, later on, students will use the word bank and the T chart created in class to compare and contrast poetry and prose, how they're similar and how they're different. They will do that first in their speaking activities when they uh, explain the differences between the two genres to a partner. And then they will uh, write uh, two paragraphs to compare and contrast the two genres. So for my key language um, uses, I put inform uh, and explain. Um, I was struggling a little bit with the most prominent language expectations since I couldn't decide whether that could be inform interpretive or inform expressive. So I put both. Um, for language expectations. And as far as lin linguistic supports go, um, as I said, uh, students will have word banks, they will have a T chart, and their speaking and writing will be supported with sentence starters and paragraph frames if needed. Okay. Very nice. Uh, it sounds like a fun unit. And I, um, I, I, I think you certainly described both um, inform and um, explain and, and in both in interpretive and expressive modes. And because your unit is large enough, um, it, that makes sense. So I, I think that um, absolutely. Okay, so really. both, both can work. Okay, thank you for okay. clarifying that. Okay. 
Okay, and we are about out of time here. So we will spend a little more time next week um, unpacking um, the uh, the work that we've done and maybe even continue a little more. I want us to reflect um, last time we spent a, quite a bit of time on looking at patterns of key language uses, the most prominent ones, how they distributed across the grade bands. And, um, and, and just real quickly, um, I, I'm going to um, summarize for um, kindergarten and grade one, the most prominent um, language use tended to, uh, key language use tended to be in form. And then when we hit grades two, three, and all the way to nine, 12, the most prominent language use was argue. And then that was followed by explain. And so when you think about those distributions of key language uses, I want you to think about how can you develop common language for all students in your school? And I'd like for you to type in some ideas into the chat box. So in thinking about kindergarten and grade one, really focusing on the key language use of inform, grades two through three, all the way up through nine, 12, first argue, then explain. What, what could you do to develop a common language for students in your school or within grade bands? What are some strategies that you can think of? For you as a language teacher. You might do a word of the week that's school wide. I've been in schools where vocabulary is hanging from the halls and students are sharing with teachers using those words in a productive way, providing teachers sentences and speaking frames of the key uses, collaboration with EL and content teachers and across vertical teams, vertical planning for common vocabulary, nice. Build a whole school approach or understanding to meeting the needs of L's of collaborative school culture. I love that, Mallory. Absolutely. Um, love those ideas. Very important as um, you advocate to your principals this, um, these are some great suggestions to begin to roll out that common language. Yep, vertical planning for key vocabulary, yep. Absolutely, align topics and literacy strategies and standards. Yes, and the key language uses is a great point of entry to content teachers because it's in a format that they are used to seeing. So one of the good uses of language expectations, um, we also, um, Glenda posed the question, of language expectations and the usefulness of them. And I think that it focuses and forces us to consider language in discrete pieces. Um, there's lots of linguistic terms that are embedded and it forces EL professionals to really dig deep. It also creates a good system for looking at language that WIDA has already done the heavy lifting of looking at all kinds of genres across grade bands 
and isolating the key language uses. And so we know that that language is appearing in text across content areas within the grade bands already. So it makes a great springboard for um, sharing language with other teachers. Okay. Whoops, I lost my heavens to Betsy. There we go. Okay. Um, I know we're a few minutes over and I uh, apologize for that. Is there anything that anyone else would like to share regarding the usefulness of language expectations? We'll work some more on our own um, units next week. I know it was a lot to um, bite off with the template. So don't worry if you're not finished, we'll pick it back up next week and work on our units some more. It'll give you some time to dig in to the WIDA standards um, and isolate those language expectations that you think marry well with learning activities that you've already planned in your unit. We thank you all for being here and we thank you, especially Lanny for leading this. I am working on an article for our upcoming, um, what are we calling it now? Program quality highlights. So if anyone has a comment they'd like to make on their experience with the module so far that they'd like to drop in the chat that we could potentially put into our, um, Article that we're writing, I would love and appreciate that. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you, Lanny. This will be posted um, hopefully by Friday, if not sooner. And we just thank you all for being here. And be sure you share your um, template. The, the forced copy that you made and worked in, be sure you um, make it so that it's viewable for anyone with the link. Oh, I'm I'm glad. Uh, uh, thank you for the kind words. Thank you for all the hard work. This was great. I think it's been an opportunity to spend some time digging in. I'm sure we could have all spent a lot longer. Uh -huh. Hopefully, people will keep working with it and bring it back next time. I'm we will work on it in module five. Some more. I'm gonna stop the recording. Okay. <laughs>